Hello everyone, welcome back. This will be the first lecture from The Psychology of Kundalini Yoga by Carl Jung. Before we get started, I want to define some words that we'll be using as we go. First, uh, I want to define the kleshas, which are a mental state in uh, Buddhism and yoga that cloud the mind and manifest in unwholesome actions such as anxiety, fear, anger, jealousy, desire, and depression. And the Sanskrit word klesha translates to poison or affliction. And they are considered the cause of suffering in yogic and Buddhist philosophy, which must be actively overcome. At the beginning of the lecture, Jung takes a question from a woman uh, from the audience where she says that she understands that the klesha uh, asmita contains the germ of being a personality and the klesha dvisha contains the wish to become two or hatred and she asks if power means personality or individuality in that statement when it has built up the individuality how would hatred be torn out by, by the roots and Jung tells her that the klesha refers to dividing and discriminating against others and developing a strong sense of self or ego that may be accompanied by fear uh, sorry by hatred and these urges are natural and instinctive arising from our unconscious mind and are the simplest form of our psychological energy or libido and tantric teachings describe a series a uh, desire to create a distinct and individual personality which is separate from others this is called the klesha of discrimination and can be understood as an instinctive drive towards individuation similarly to what is described in western philosophy the drive to become an individual is present in all living things as every form of life is naturally unique and distinct life has an innate tendency to create individuals that are as complete and fully realized as possible such as a bird with with uh, with its uh, distinctive feathers distinctive colors and size and this uh, urge towards realization is also present in humans and encourages us to be true to ourselves. However, many obstacles and inhibitions can hinder us from becoming who we are meant to be. Given the chance to grow and develop freely, humans would naturally become their true selves. The klesha that contains the seed of personality can also be referred to as the klesha of individuation because personality is an aspect of becoming an individual. Even if you don't become fully realized as yourself, you will still become a person with a certain conscious form, right? However, this is only a uh, part of, who, of your true individuality, which may be still hidden. What is visible on the surface is a unit, but you may not be aware of the totality of who you are, and other people may even see you more clearly than you can see yourself. And individuality exists everywhere and is present in all living things such as dogs and plants. However, many of these living things are not consciously aware of their individuality for example a dog may may have limited understanding of itself compared to its entire individuality and similarly people are individuals from the beginning of their lives but they may not be conscious of it although most people may only have a limited sense of themselves as egos they are still individuated in some way Individuation only occurs when a person becomes conscious of their individuality, but individuality is always present from the start of their existence. 
and the woman mentions that she still does not understand where hatred comes from. And Yoon goes on to say that hatred is the force that creates division and discrimination. Even in a loving relationship, there is a need for some degree of hatred in order to differentiate oneself from the other person. At the beginning of a relationship, the two individuals may be very similar and may experience a lot of emotional bonding, but as time passes, they may develop a sense of opposition or even hostility towards each other. This is because they they need to create boundaries to establish their own individuality and separate themselves from uh, the other person. This phenomenon can also be observed in psychoanalysis when exaggerated attachment to to a therapist can lead to corresponding resistance or even hatred towards them. The ancient Greeks used the term phobos to describe the force of separation instead of hatred. According to them, the first force that arises in human existence is either eros, which means love, or phobos, which means fear, and that de depends on uh, individual's temperament. And some people believe that love is the most important force in the world, while others see fear as the dominant force. Fear or phobos is actually more powerful than hatred because it makes us run away from danger and remove ourselves from harm's way. And Yang goes on to say, A Hindu once asked me a philosophical question. Would a person who loves God take more or less time to reach salvation than someone who hates God? I didn't know the answer, but the Hindu said that a person who loves God would take seven incarnations to become perfect, while someone who hates God would take only three. This is because hatred is a strong force that can mo motivate a person. In Greece, they call this force phobos, again, which means fear. It separate, uh, separates people more than uh, hatred. And in India, there is more of a feeling of unity with others than separation. While in the West, we tend to be more individualistic. Therefore, fear may be a better way for us to separate ourselves from others than hatred. And the woman asks if uh, the yogi would consider the state of hatred a necessary condition in building up individuality. And Dr. Jung says yes, he cannot help consider it so for the whole yoga process, whether classic uh, or kundalini yoga naturally has a tendency to make the individual one even as the god is one like brahman an existing non-existing non oneness and real quick i want to let you know what brahman is for those that don't know so brahman is a sanskrit word that refers to the highest universal principle also called the ultimate or absolute reality it also means that which never changes, knowledge, and infinity. The question uh, continues. And when it has built up the individuality, how would hatred be torn out by the roots? And he goes on to say that the difference between the stula and sukshma aspects is uh, an important and confusing concept in this uh, terminology. The stula aspect is the urge to be an uh, object and subject, which is mixed with hatred in the imperfect condition. In the sukshma aspect, the same urge becomes the power to develop a personality. The prana aspect, which Professor Howard considers metaphysical, is something that I don't fully understand and cannot explain," said Jung. So the stula aspect refers to uh, to the things as we see them, while the shukma 
aspect refers to the abstraction or philosophical conclusions we draw from observed facts. So when people try to become individuals and resist each other, we may see that the stula aspect and we feel the klesha of hatred called dvesha. But if we go a step higher, we understand that this foolish kind of hatred and resistance are merely external aspects of very important and profound things. For example, when a person complains about always being on bad terms with their loved ones and having terrible fights with them, it's often because they are living in participation mystique with those uh, that they love and this means they have uh, spread themselves over other people until they have become identical with them which violates the principle of individuality as a result they experience resistance from uh, others to maintain their own individuality of course it's most uh, regrettable that you always get in trouble but don't you see what you're doing? You love some uh, somebody, you identify with them, and of course you prevail against the objects of your, your love and repress them by your very self-evident identity. You handle them as if they were yourself, and naturally there will be a resistance. It is a violation of individuality of those people and it is a sin against your own individuality. Those resistances are a most useful and important instinct. You have resistances, scenes and disappointments so that you may uh, become finally conscious of yourself and then hatred is no more. That is the... That is the sukshma aspect and understanding the nature of love and hatred can bring peace of mind to a person they will realize that loving someone will eventually lead to hatred and this understanding will allow them to accept the ups and downs of life without worrying excessively they will be able to see the paradox of life that perfection is unattainable and that uh, situations are not always clear-cut. The analytical process can help in uprooting hatred by explaining the sukshma aspect which is um, on the level of understanding abstraction, theory and wisdom. By realizing what may seem like a regrettable habit or inexplicable disagreement in the stula aspect is quite different in the shukshma aspect. The person can gain a new perspective on their own emotions and those of others. The second question is whether there is a psychological equivalent to tattva and samskara. We'll have to define some words again. So tattva in Sanskrit uh, is a term meaning principle or reality and according to various Indian schools of philosophy tattvas are the elements or aspect of reality that constitute human experience and samskara are mental uh, impressions, recollections or psychological imprints found in Indian philosophy and Indian religions they are a basis for the development of karma theory in Hinduism and Buddhism. The literal meaning of samskara is well planned or well thought out, referring to an action taken with full awareness of its goals. So let's move on with the, with the lecture. So the tattva, which is the essence of things, has a psychological equivalent in the form of the sukshma aspect of things for example libido or energy is a tattva that has a psychological equivalent and energy is not something that can be observed in nature 
It is an abstraction that represents a certain level of intensity of natural forces. It is important to note that the energy we refer to in everyday language is often metaphorical uh, energy and not the true essence of energy. In the same way, samskara, which is a tendency or pattern of behavior, can also have a psychological equivalent as an abstraction that can represent a certain pattern of behavior or thought. Therefore, both tattva and samskara have psychological equivalents that are abstractions of their sukshma aspect. And Jung says that the Eastern mind tends to be more concrete in nature. When they arrive at a conclusion or build up an abstraction, it becomes a substance that is almost visible or audible and can be touched. However, in Western culture, this process is more superficial. For example, when the concept of energy becomes widespread, people assume it must be something tangible that can be put into a bottle and sold. But in reality, energy is not substantial, but rather an intensity of physical or material processes. In the East, when someone speaks of tattva, they conceive of it as already in existence, as if it were a visible and complete existence. While no one knows if anyone has ever had a vision of, of a tattva, they can visualize any concept regardless of how abstract it is. In the West, the concept of tattva is uh, more abstract and it is an idea. Examples of other abstract ideas include the principles of gravity, the idea of an atom or electrons. In psychology, the equivalent of tattva would be the libido, which is also a concept. The samskara is a concept that is hard to explain in simple ways. It's something that people in the East underst understand as a concrete uh, thing, but we in the West have trouble seeing it that way. It's a philosophical idea that um, only really makes sense if you believe in things like reincarnation or pre-existing conditions. It's similar to our idea of heredity or the collective unconscious. When a child is born, their mind isn't completely blank because there are already a lot of ideas and images in their unconscious mind. These ideas are called archetypes and they're kind of like the western equivalent of uh, samskara. However, the way eastern people understand samskara is different from our understanding, so it's hard to compare them directly. Archetypes are the closest thing we have to understanding samskara. And someone else wants to ask about the stula aspect. So this gentleman says that he thought the stula was the more physical aspect and that the sukshma was the psychological, not only the uh, abstract aspect. For it cannot be perceived by intellect only. It is a peculiar kind of being connected with things and Jung tells him that he is quite correct but the psychological aspect of uh, things implies also a philosophy about them and Jung gives an example as, as follows a chair has two aspects a physical aspect what we can see and a non-physical aspect or the idea of a chair this non-physical aspect is called the sukshma aspect. In the philosophy of uh, Plato, this non-physical aspect is called the idos or idolon. And Plato believed that these idos or eidos existed in a heavenly storehouse and that uh, everything in the physical world was a derivative of those uh, Edos. However, in modern times, we don't believe in this heavenly storehouse. 
Instead, we see these non-physical aspects as psychological concepts. And in primitive cultures, they believed that if they thought about something, it would become real. They were careful not to think about certain things. We still have this kind of thinking, like when we say something and then touch uh, wood for, for good luck. Someone from the audience asks if the sukshma aspect is the same as the Kant's uh, thing in itself. And Jung says yes, that's right. Kant also used the term numenum to refer to the spiritual essence of a thing. Kant was a very critical thinker and in his book Critique of Pure Reason, he said that thing in itself is just a concept that shows there's something beyond the world of things we can see, but we can't say anything more about it. However, in his lectures about psychology, he talked about noumena, as if there were many things in themselves which contradicts his earlier books. And someone ask, uh, asks if, uh, if that's really not an uh, archetype. And Jung says yes, in Plato's uh, philosophy, the Eidos or Eidos is actually an archetype. And the term archetype comes from um, Saint Augustine, who used it in the same way as Plato. And Augustine was a Neoplatonist, which means he followed the idea of Plato like many other philosophers of its time. But back then the ideas weren't seen as psychological concepts like they are today. Instead, they were treated as concrete things. They were hypothesized, which means that they were given substance. And hypothesis isn't the same thing as a... Sorry, hypostasis isn't the same as hypothesis. A hype, uh, yeah, A hypothesis is just a guess or an assumption. But with the hypostasis, there is something real underneath that provides a foundation. And next, uh, someone asks, from what root does hypostasis comes from? And Jung says that histomy is the Greek verb to be standing, and hypo means below. The same root is in the Greek word um, ikonostasis, which uh, in the Greek Orthodox Church is the background behind the altar where the statues of the saints stand. The image or picture of the saint is called an ikon, I-K-O-N, and, and the ikonostasis is the place upon which it stands, usually a pedestal or a wall upon which are placed such images or pictures. So to make a hypostasis means to invent a subject which is hanging in the air. It, is, it has no basis, but you assume that it has and say that it's a real thing. For instance, you invent the idea of tadva and say it is by no means a mere word or breath of air with nothing underneath it. You say tadva is an essence, it is something substantial, something is standing underneath that uh, holds it up. A hypostasis contains always the assumption that a thing really is and the natural primitive mind is always, uh, is always hypostatizing. In our better moments, when we are a bit superstitious, we also have hypostasis. So Dr. Yan is saying that when we when we hypostatize something, we assume it is real and has a basis, even though it may not. For example, we assume that gravity exists and that it's uh, the reason why the apple falls. Similarly, when we talk about God. Some people may say that God exists, but others may say he doesn't. 
So when we're doing that, we assume that God is real and exists in reality. This can sometimes lead to unfortunate situations where we declare that something is true without fully verifying it. The animus or inner masculine can sometimes do this and it can lead to problems such as a house burning down because we thought we put out the fire. And someone else uh, asks if all the heuristic principles tend to become hypostasis, to which uh, Dr. Young agrees, saying that as soon as a, uh, a hypothesis has some evidence of its usefulness, it starts being taken as truth and people forget that it was only a hypothesis. And someone gives an example of this by referring to Freud's sexual theory, which was initially just a hypothesis, but then became a hypostasis after providing its evidence with some facts. And Dr. Jung agrees and adds that this is only about concepts and in tantric yoga, some things need further explanation from the... Uh, psychological side. Someone else from the audience asks if the total chakra could be called a mandala since Professor Hauer only referred to the picture uh, inside each of the mandala. And Dr. Yang replied that the chakras are also sometimes called mandalas, although Professor Hauer did not attach the same technical meaning to the term as, as they do. He explained that the mandala means a ring or a circle and can refer to a magic circle or a cycle. In the Vedic Sutras, a series of chapters uh, that form a cycle are called a mandala, such as the third mandala, chapter 10, verse 15. Thus, mandala is uh, simply the name of a cycle. And she goes on to say, but he called a square a mandala. Because, again, a mandala is usually round, right? But Dr. Jung said, yes, he used the term mandala to refer to a square as well. And anything that is contained within, uh, within it can also be considered a mandala. And this is evident in the Lamaistic pictures where the mandala or lotus is situated inside a temple surrounded by a magic circle and um, cloister with circle walls above are the gods and below are the mountains this is the the best picture i could find for for this so i'm not sure if he's referring to this exact same image but close enough and the word mandala has a different meaning for us than it does in india in india it's simply one of the um, the uh, yantras, a tool used in worship in the Lamaistic cult and in tantric yoga. However, the tantric school is not well known in India. If you were to ask millions of uh, Hindus, they wouldn't have a clue about what it is. And he goes on to say that would be like asking the citizens of Zurich about scholasticism. And scholasticism was a medieval school of philosophy that employed a critical, organic method of philosophical analysis um, predicated upon the Aristotelian ten uh, categories. It sought to solve general philosophical problems such as faith and reason, will and intellect, realism and uh, nominalism, and the probability of the existence of God so they wouldn't know much just as the uh, Hindus don't know much about tantric yoga if you ask a Hindu what a mandala was they'd say that any circular object was a mandala but for us a mandala has a specific meaning even within the tantric school the mandala isn't as significant as it is for us. Our interpretation of it uh, is closest to Lamaism, the Tibetan religion, 
which is not well known in its textbooks were only recently translated about 10 years ago. And just a reminder, this lecture is from uh, 1932, by the way. And Jung says that one of the main sources is the Sri Chakra Sambara, a tantric text that Sir John Woodrow translated. And another person mentions that Professor Howard believed that in the second chakra of the water region, one dives into life without any reservations. However, this region is still beyond our reach and it's hard to accept its interpretation because when a young person goes into life without reservations, it's as if uh, they're going from a higher level to a lower one. And Dr. Jung responded by saying that he was confusing things and bringing confusion to the world by asking such questions. And he acknowledged that when one tries to interpret this uh, material in psychological terms, it leads to um, surprising conclusions. For example, take the Mudalahara Chakra, which seems simple. Its psychological position is in the perineum, but it's not just about sexuality or other unpleasant things as people tend to assume. Instead, Mudalahara means something entirely different. Perhaps they should examine the second chakra first, according to Young. The ocean with its sea monsters is associated with the chakra system above, but in reality we often experience it as something within our own psychology, located below, in our unconscious mind. This means that our understanding of the Mudalahara chakra may be different from what we might assume. And Jung says that, uh, he asks, have you ever explored the Mudalahara chakra? Some of you may have dwelled into your unconscious mind, encountering sea monsters like the uh, Leviathan. This would suggest that you've reached the Swadhisthana chakra, which uh, relates to, to the water element. However, have you also explored the Mudalahara chakra? This is where things get tricky. Mudalahara is a vast and complex world, much like each of the chakras. Each uh, chakra represents a whole world in itself. And he asks if uh, they recall the image of the patient tangled, uh, tangled in roots, in the roots of a tree, and then, uh, then above she was stretching up towards the light. And he goes on to say, now, where was that woman when she was in the, in the roots? And the answer is in the Mudalahara. Yes, but in what condition would that be in reality? And the question was, uh, was the self sleeping? And Jung says, yes, indeed, the self is sleeping in this stage. The question is, at what point is the self asleep? and the ego conscious. Here in our everyday lives, we're all reasonable and respectable individuals adapted to the social norms and expectations of our respective states. Everything runs smoothly. We have lunch plans, appointments, and the other obligations that we must fulfill. We can't just run away from them without becoming neurotic. We're firm, firmly grounded in the roots of our existence, which is what Mudalahara means in its literal uh, translation. So you can see here in this image the Mudalahara, the bottom chakra, has some roots coming out, right? Where we are firmly rooted in this world, whether we're buying tickets from the streetcar conductor or paying a waiter. This is the reality that we experience in our day, uh, daily lives. At this stage, the self is asleep, and so is our connection to the divine realm, according to Jung. He goes on to say that now, 
we must examine whether this interpretation is truly justifiable. However, I'm not entirely certain and even doubt that Professor Howard would agree with me immediately. It takes a great deal of understanding of psychology to make these concepts palatable to the Western mind. If we don't approach them carefully and allow ourselves to make mistakes with integrating them in our own psychology, we could end up harming ourselves. These symbols have a tendency to stick to our unconscious mind and become like a foreign substance within our system, inhibiting our natural growth and development of our own psyche. It's like a secondary growth or poison. That's why we must make heroic attempts to understand and master these concepts and even work against their influence to prevent them from negatively impacting our psyche. We must not fully comprehend, uh, you may not fully comprehend uh, what I'm saying, but please take it as a hy uh, hypothesis. It's more than a hypothesis, it's the truth. I've seen too many instances where the influence of the symbols uh, were dangerous. If we consider Mudalahara as the root upon which we stand, it must be our conscious world since we stand on this earth and within the four corners of the earth. We reside within the earth uh, mandala and everything can be said about Mudalahara is also true about the world. This is a place where humans are influenced by impulses, instincts, uh, unconsciousness and participation mystique. We often find ourselves in a dark and unconscious place where we're help, uh, hapless victims of our uh, circumstances and our reasoning skills can do very little to change it. In peaceful times, we may use techniques to gain control. However, during times of great turmoil, such as a war or revolution, everything can be destroyed and we can be left with nothing. Moreover, when we are in this three-dimensional space, um, talking sense and doing apparently meaningful things, we are non-individual, we are just fish in the sea. Only at times we have a inkling of the next chakra. Something works in certain people on Sunday mornings or perhaps one day in the year, say Good Friday, they feel a gentle urge to go to the church. Many people instead have an urge to go to mountains in nature where they have another sort of emotion. Now, that is uh, a faint a faint staring of the sleeping beauty, something which is not to be accounted for starts in the unconscious. Some strange urge underneath uh, forces them to do something which is not just the uh, ordinary thing. So we, m we may assume that the place where the self, the psychological non-ego is uh, asleep in the most uh, banal place in the world, a railway station, a theater, the family, the professional situation, there are gods, uh, sorry, there the gods are sleeping. They are just uh, reasonable or as unreasonable as unconscious animals. And this is the Mudalahara. If that is so, then the next chakra, the Svadhisthana must be the unconscious symbolized by the sea and in the sea is a huge leviathan right so a huge leviathan which threatens one with annihilation moreover we must remember that men have made they have made these uh, these symbols tantric yoga in its old form is surely the work of men so we can expect a good deal of masculine psychology. Therefore, no wonder that in the second chakra is the great half moon, which is of course a female symbol. 
also the whole thing is in the form of the Padma or Lotus. And of course the Lotus is the Yoni. And Padma is simply the erratic name, the metaphor for the Yoni, the female organ. And this is the end of the first lecture. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something. I surely did. I found this really interesting and I hope you have as well. Please, uh, please subscribe if you have uh, not done already so. Thanks for watching again. Take care and I'll see you guys in the next one.